Good afternoon, everybody. Happy Wednesday. My name is Baruch Dix, and alongside my fellow student council members, I'm elated to introduce our third speaker in our Democracy and Vulnerability series, education activist, school board member, and Culver City community caretaker, Tristan Esdor. Just a year after graduating from Culver City High School, Tristan won a seat on the Culver City School Board. Since being elected, Tristan has spent every moment pushing forward and causing dramatic changes in the ways classrooms treat marginalized students. Watching and experiencing the many difficulties Black students deal with in the classroom, Tristan sought to create a better learning experience for Black students. Tristan brings a unique perspective to the educational leadership and policy, believing intently that all students deserve an environment where they can flourish regardless of background. His journey from the classroom to the boardroom has been marked by a dedication to tackling complex issues with tangible solutions for his community, building inclusive coalitions and delivering tangible results for his community. We'd also like to extend our thanks to Susan Horowitz and Rick Feldman for their generous support for the online and on-site discussion series on, at the Venda. Today's program will be one hour will be a one hour discussion with Tristan that will be moderated by student council member Lexi Dooley. Questions during the discussion will be asked by council members Amy Cabrales, Sarah Abramson, Lexi, and myself. A blog post about this program will be posted later on and will be made by Amy. Tristan, it's a pleasure to be speaking with you this evening. Now I'll be passing things on to Lexi. Thank you, Baruch and Tristan. Thank you again for being here today. We're so excited to talk to you about everything. Um, I can get it started with a quick question that I had, um, just broad overview so we can get to know a little bit more about you. Um, but what inspired you to pursue a career in public service, particularly in education and youth advocacy? Yeah, Lexi, thank you so much. And to the student council for your, for your leadership and for inviting me here today. Um, it's a really interesting question. I got started at a really unique uh, moment in my time, but I think a unique moment in American history when we saw, I think, an uptick and an insurgence of young people um, wanting to come to the table um, where decisions are being made. I got my start in activism when I was a student in, in the district that I now have the distinct honor and privilege of of representing. Um, when I was a junior in high school, my, my summer between junior and senior year, um, 2020, um, the pandemic happened, I think, put a spotlight on government and how uh, governments can affect um, our communities on the day-to-day -day lives. And I think a lot of people looked to um, government to know what the protocols were, right? What are the mask mandates? Where can we go? What are the what are the distancing guidelines? What does the CDC say? It was our school boards who voted to to close our schools and ultimately our school boards who voted to open it. Um, and then, then I think, um, a video that was seen around the world happened the summer between my junior um, and senior year um, where George Floyd was murdered. And I think a mass protest across um, the world, people took to the streets to make sure that their voices were heard, particularly young people, particularly young um, black and brown youth wanting to have very tough and frank conversations about policing and public safety and how we can make sure that we are viewing all of our legislative priorities through a racial and social justice lens. And so, um, I got involved during that time in, in in my life. I started going to school board meetings and city council meetings um, from Zoom. I would see what's happening in the halls of Congress, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, you know, it was uh, a very interesting thing to see. I don't know if anyone here has had the privilege of watching a school board meeting, but um, <laughs> at that time, they were very um, intense. They were very intense. They were routinely eight, nine, ten hours long. Um, and, you know, I think that I saw the outcomes of a legislative body that didn't have an elected official with the lived and shared experience. When I started active, when I started, um, we didn't even have student board members with preferential votes. And so we've come a long way, um, I think, as a district since since three years ago when I was a student in the district. But it it, it fired me up enough to, to throw my hat in the ring and, and say that, it, you know, if I think that we need to change and I think that I have the lived and shared experience to run, that it was that it was my job to to do it. And so um, a year and a half in, uh, it's going well, doing a lot of work. There's much more we need to do. Um, but I think it's groups like this um, and and young people like you all um, that, that that makes it all worth it for me. 
Well, thank you. I mean, I can only imagine like as a student who was learning and being in school during this time, like I definitely was driven to learn more about everything that was going on. And I didn't, I could not imagine joining the school board like only a year and a half after graduating. That's absolutely insane, but it's so impressive. Um, so we just wanna thank you again for everything you're doing. Um, but to sat on, um, in the USC Annenberg Media article, you mentioned facing feelings of discomfort and confusion regarding race, sexuality, and career choices during your childhood. Since then, how have these challenges informed your understanding of inclusivity, diversity, and representation within the school district? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a it's a great question, Lexi. Um, I think that just in my mere twenty years of 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 living um in this world, we've we've come a long way. Um, you know, when I was born, it was before um we had enshrined the rights for LGBTQ people to marry, right? And so, like now, we are at a point. Um, right now, we're not we're not only seeing on legislative bodies um a uh, legislative divide. I think we're starting to see a generational divide. Um, I think in the hundred seventeenth Congress, the average age. Um, for people serving, I think was something to the tune of 60 years old. Um, and so now I think we are seeing an uptick in um, young people, young voices, um, deciding to throw their hat in the ring and be a part of the solutions. And so I think that uh, I definitely stand on the shoulders of my mentors, um, our great mayor, Yasmin McMorrin, but all of our strong leaders here in Culver City, Assemblyman Isaac Bryan, Congresswoman Sydney Kamleger Dove, um, who have uh, shattered the glass ceiling um, in order for me to be stepping in uh, to this to this moment right now and doing the work to make sure that we are driving our communities forward. I think um, what we're seeing nationwide and. Uh, Republican districts, specifically on our school boards, um, an uptake in banning books, an uptake of of censoring of American history, our shared history. Um, and I think that it's uh, people coming to the table like me and my colleagues, but I'm very inspired by an uptake of young people running for school boards that are making sure that we are uh, advancing our communities forward and not looking backwards. Um, and so I think that it is our collective work and and how we are working together at every single level of government that's given me a lot of hope um, and allowed for me to be here today, but there's still so much more that we can do. Great, thank you. Along those same lines of collective work and mentors in the past, Sarah has a great question um, about that. Yeah, um, so you just mentioned the particular impact of the 2020 political moment on your decision to participate in politics, but I also read in your bio on the Culver City Unified School District website that your commitment to serving others was shaped by your family and moral values. And you mentioned in another interview that you ran for school board to represent your little brother. And I was just wondering if you could tell us more about this relation between your family life, your upbringing and your political activity. Yeah, yeah, it's a really good question. Uh, historically in Culver City, but I think historically for school boards, it really was just parents who were running um, to represent um, their kids, but also all kids. And so I think that um, it is a little second removed from um, my experience and lens that I bring to the legislative body. Um, specifically in education is overwhelmingly um, represented by white women and, and severely underrepresented by black and brown men, specifically black men. Um, and I think that uh, we've seen um, how our legislative bodies and the outcomes um, that come with legislation when we don't have lived and shared experience at the table. And so although I, I, I come to the table and advocate on behalf of my brother, who's a, who's a Black boy, Black man in high school um, in our district, um, but I also advocate for uh, who I was just two years ago, three years ago, the voice and representation that I wish I had um, on the body. I'm the first Black man to serve on the board. Um, and it, it's very telling when we see numbers of uh, overrepresentation in suspension and expulsion data, underrepresentation, underrepresentation in AP and honors curriculum. And so um, I think I speak not just for um, who I wish I had on the board when I was a student, not just for my brother, but I think all of the black boys, black and brown men, um, but really just people who have historically been left out and left behind of um, our legislative bodies. 
Yeah, you talk about how parents are running to represent students and there are no students running to represent students. And I feel like that's such a good point. And I didn't even know that you could do this until reading about you. And I didn't know this was a possibility. So I think that it's such a great thing. And you're such a mo like model to all of these students who now know that they can take charge of their future and kind of, I don't know, be the representation that they want to see. Um, and along those same lines, Amy has a question about representation. So here, Amy. Yeah, thank you, Lexi. Um, my question might be a little more broad, but I think it'll still be a good opportunity to reflect your experience so far. Um, so I noticed representation is one of your core themes. And according to the USC Annenberg uh, media article we mentioned already, you stated that uh, resources and policy was only geared towards one specific student. And when only one type of person is represented in positions of power, it trickles down and only supports those who look like those in power. And I thought that was a really great way to explain the importance of representation. Um, and I believe that having this lack of representation can, you know, weaken democracies and directly affect those who live in the democracy. So, so far in your experience, have you noticed any other factors that can weaken um, a democracy and thus make it more vulnerable? Definitely. And I think that what um, Americans are experiencing, I think specifically young people, is just a ton of exhaustion. Um, I'm exhausted. I'm sure you all as college students as well are exhausted, um, but our communities are exhausted as well. Um, there are so many campaigns to focus on. There are so many elections. We ask for people to vote. We tell people that everything's on the line every single election, and I'm not sure that our communities are seeing um, the outcomes that they were promised during an election year. And so asking them to show up and show out with the same amount of urgency um, and the same amount of um, um, yeah, fierceness um, it, it can lead to a lot of exhaustion. And I think it shows up um, when who pays attention to the decisions that are being made, not in election years. Um, and so uh, during election years, I can now say as someone who is on the other side of the dais, um, hearing all the public comments, seeing all of uh, the emails from our community members who are concerned about what's going on in our district, um, is I think less and less people um, pay attention. And to me, that that weakens democracy and it weakens engagement. But uh, I don't think that that onus and work is on the people who are experiencing it. I think that's actually on policymakers for not um, doing the work to actively uh, engage communities, actively engage diverse communities, but to make sure that they're doing the extra work and going the extra mile to meet community members where they are. And so um, I'm proud to have uh, with my colleagues, been on a um, district-wide community listening session. We recently went for a bond, $358 million in facilities that passed this primary election season. I mean, to me, that that is the work that I think should be um, sustained um, ongoing. I think we need to be going to school sites, going to community places, going to our faith-based um, um, community meeting points, um, and talking to everyday people who may think that their voice doesn't matter and that their elected officials aren't listening to them, and to let them know that their um, voices uh, matter and that we take it into consideration um, each and every day we we, we legislate. And so I, I I think that a lack of engagement and an uptick in exhaustion weakens democracy. And I too think that I own part of that responsibility. I think that us um, as policymakers and elected leaders um, have to own that and make sure that we're doing the work to meet people where they are in the community. Just to add a question, I wonder how do you recommend or what do you recommend for um, constituents and people in the community to comprehensively and thoughtfully take in all of this information so that they can be engaged with their community? Because I know it sometimes is like so overwhelming. You know, it's really interesting. Um, I remember having to learn um, all the education terms and all the policy terms um, myself when I was um, a junior and a senior in high school trying to get involved in my local community. Um, and what I realized is that it's very clear that um, these systems weren't designed for people to uh, learn. I think that they were designed for people to not be engaged. I think pre-pandemic, pre-2016, um, I think that specifically for the school board, um, the numbers of attendees um, to each meeting was dismal. Um, they used to fly through the agenda, start at six, end at seven or eight, and just yes, 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 yes. Um, and so, you know, I, I, I don't know. I'm, 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 you know, I, I still think that we, 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 we have to own that, and we need to do our, our educating piece. I'm, you know, proud to have, um, you know, weekly newsletter. 
um, to go out to the community um, that teaches people how to register for meetings, that shows people how to read the agenda and breaks down all the really complex um, wording that we use um, in bureaucracies. It's very hard to read these agendas. It's very inaccessible. They're very thick and they're very um, legally written, um, which is great because we need to be compliant with state law. Um, and we also have to own the work of making sure that our um, priorities and our um, agendas, our meetings, ourselves are all accessible um, to the people. And so um, I think it would be a big ask for me to suggest how communities can learn bureaucratic terms that in my humble opinion were created to not be accessible. I, I still think that, that that onus is on us um, as people, figureheads, a part of uh, bureaucratic institutions, as elected officials, um, to make sure that we are um, uh, watering down and simplifying our language so that uh, communities find it more, more accessible. Well, thank you. Um, and Baruch has a question kind of along the same lines about accessibility and educational discrimination. Uh, earlier, you were like talking during Sarah's question about how like uh, like the discrepancies of like black students in like honors or AP level classes, and like as like a like a black guy that's been going to like predominantly white institutions like my whole life, like that's something like I've always noticed. Just like and like from like a counselor, like anybody, like there's always like a difference in treatment. And my question is kind of like. Was there any experience or like specific moment during like your elementary school or like secondary schooling that kind of like pushed you to want to like work towards like erasing like kind of like racial inequality in like the school environment? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great question. Um, and I I I I think I share um that experience um attending predominantly white um institutions as a USC student currently myself. Um, but I remember vividly when I was in high school, um, we have conversations about, about tracking and, and part of my work as a board member, when we talk about true racial equity in schools, to me, it really starts in first and second grade, making sure that our black boys are reading, um, especially in the new generation of how we are, um, teaching students. Um, we've seen that, um, it's actually in third grade, you stop learning to read and start reading to learn. Um, and so I think there are studies that show that in, in kindergarten, you're taught, um, like you hold the book up and down, you're taught to read left and right, up to down, you're taught phonics. Um, it's really easy for, or not easy, but I think that that's where if you were an English learner, um, they would catch phonics um, there in second grade. Um, but if we don't catch kids' lack of reading in third grade um, and kids start reading to learn, what we start to see is um, kids aren't learning because they're unable to read the problems. And now with Common Core, what we see in math is this uh, new um, way of curriculum that asks students to write out how they got the math answer. So it's not just what's two plus two. You have to write out um, how you got that answer. And so even if the math and the answer is right, but the wording and the writing is wrong, it's wrong. Um, and so the way I've experienced this myself um, is when I was a uh, uh, high school junior, I was in geometry class and I actually didn't end up doing well. Um, and not because I wasn't able to do math, but that's because I wasn't able to uh, explain in words uh, to the standard that they were looking for how I solved the problem. And it actually was placed into remedial math, um, which was a remedial math course that actually wouldn't have made me A through G eligible. Um, but would have allowed me the credits to pass, but not be um, college ready. Um, if it wasn't for my remedial math teacher, Mr. Buchanan, um, who saw that I was able to comprehend basic math school math, math skills um, and knew that I uh, should not be here. Um, he saw me, saw that, went to my counselor um, and asked that I be removed out of remedial class and be placed into his algebra too. I mean, so if it wasn't for that experience, if it wasn't for him seeing um, the work that I was capable of and my potential, um, I don't think I would be here right now. I don't think I'd be on the school board and I definitely wouldn't be um, at the University of Southern California. And so I think that it is that lived experience precisely um, 
is the lens that I uh, often uh, view our legislative policies uh, at the district through. Yeah, I feel like that's far too common of an occurrence, like needing someone to see your potential and then they can advocate for you on your behalf to create change. And I feel like that's so sad because even like in this, like when I was in high school, like two years ago, things along the same lines have happened. And it's just like kind of crazy that certain school systems are supposed to be there to help support you, but you need like somebody that believes in you first to help you if you look a certain way, which is ridiculous, but great that it happens. Um, and now I wanted to shift the focus from inequity and inequality in terms of race to inequity and inequality in terms of age. So I want to pass the question to Sarah. Yeah, um, well, the way that you just described kind of the timeline of learning to read and how it relates to racial inequity, um, and also your belief in the importance of early reading skills among Black students, it's clearly very reflective of your own personal experience, um, and also your very nuanced understanding of education as it has been contextualized by your experience as a young person with recent high school experiences. So um, kind of along those lines, being a younger individual with an interest in politics, I often feel like my voice is dismissed due to my age. Um, I've been told my beliefs are idealistic and shaped by my lack of life experience. Um, so I was wondering what you think, um, how can we as young people kind of inheriting this current political circumstance push past these attitudes and see our age as, um, they, they kind of see our age as a weakness, but like, how could we channel that vulnerability as the power that it really is? You know, it's a great question. And I, I definitely faced um, similar concerns at a heightened level during during my campaign. I know I announced my campaign at 18 um, and ultimately won at 19. Um, and so this conversation about age being equated to political will, um, and lived experience um, and understanding of the legislative pen um, to me was uh, second to the issues. Um, and so if the question is about advice for young people, um, what I have done and what I would recommend would be to um, stay head down and focused on the work. Um, no other person running for office uh, at all levels um, is asked about age being a relating factor to uh, ability. The state law is very clear. You have to be a registered voter and you have to be registered in the state that you're writing to represent. Um, that is the law. And so um, as someone who likes to uphold that, um, I think that that's the only thing that we need to be talking about. Um, I think young people are uh, qualified and professional every day. Um, and I think to uh, get inspired um, through activism, um, issues-based. Um, and so we ran a very uh, community-based, issues-based campaign. Um, we weren't talking about age because age doesn't matter when Black and brown kids aren't reading. And so we ran um, a very clear-eyed and focused on the challenges of the moment, but clear still on the promise of the future campaign. Um, and so that would be what I would um, suggest to young people um, is to show people um, our abilities um, to stay focused um, on the issues. And I think that communities um, can often see a lot of uh, buy-in uh, that way. I think that there's an, a very uh, popular saying um, that says that uh, first they uh, fight you, or, or I think it's first they laugh at you, then they fight you, and then we win. And so uh, I think that that's something that I often hold uh, close to my heart, definitely during the campaign, but in my capacity as an elected official myself, um, knowing that um, I am here to do the work. Um, age is not a determination of, I think, political will. Um, when you have the power of the community, the community behind you and the communities interest um in your mind every day I, I i don't think that it that it matters for sure yeah it's it's really interesting that you said nobody else except for young people are asked about age as a determinant um of our ability and i think that's definitely to you know discredit us based on our very 
passionate ideas that are based on our experience as young people. Um, so to kind of get more into your personal experience, uh, many of us on the council are currently undergraduate students like yourself. So I was wondering if you could tell us what it's like to be a school board member and a college student at the same time. And then maybe as an extension of that, given that you're a political science major, um, how do these two responsibilities play into each other? Yeah, um, great question. I um, have gotten really good at Google Calendar. Um, so that is great. Um, and I you know, I talked about this a bit in LA Times, but if you looked in my car, you would maybe think that I was living there because I have like hangers with like suit jackets and hoodies and shorts and like sneakers, but also dress shoes. It's very interesting, but it's because um, I often go straight from class uh, to work. Um, when I first got on the board, I had classes on Tuesdays and we have our board meetings on Tuesdays. So I would actually have classes from like 10 a.m. to four and our meetings start at five. So I would be changing um, in my car or in the bathroom um, before I went into um, to City Hall to, uh, to govern for the students of this great district. And so um, that is uh, what that is like, it is it, it is definitely both a sprint and and a marathon. But um, I think that the work that we're doing is is, is part time, and um, my colleagues and people in legislative bodies have full time jobs and are raising families and are married. And so I just think that if um, they're able to do that and still have time um, to govern. Uh, for the people every single day, I think that I'm able to go to go to school and and to do the same thing. I am um, my major and the work that I do uh, are intersected heavily, and to me, I think that that's a benefit because in my political science classes, we're often talking about um, where we've been um, to actually talk about the moment in time we're in now um, and how what we're seeing. We talk about book bans, when we talk about political polarization, um, we talk about voter suppression is not new. Um, and so uh, to me, that helps me um, know that uh, we've been here before, um, but I'm also around young, civically engaged political science students who are also offering tangible, pieces of information um, for how we can get out of it. And I think that we need more of that. Um, I think that we, for so long, have had elected officials who've only been surrounded by like-minded people. And that's why the policies and outcome data is very reflective of that. And so I actually think that it's a plus for me to be um, learning right now in school as we all collectively learn how to get out of the toughest issues that we find ourselves in. Well, perfect. You mentioned like this collective aspect of learning and Amy had a question about kind of like um, the unifying aspect of learning in generations. And so I'm going to pass it to Amy. Yeah, you kind of touched upon it a little bit with Sarah's first question, but I guess I'll put it to a more broad scale. Um, what advice would you give to people in your generation, Gen Z as a whole, uh, who are currently pursuing politics, such as through activism, um, or to those who want to pursue a career in politics, maybe like your brother um, in the near future? Well, I don't think that uh, my brother wants to pursue a career <laughs> um, in politics. I think that my brother is, is really concerned right now about um, what's going on on the new video game and on his Xbox. And so um, I think that what I don't buy is, you know, I was, I was at a, I was at a panel last week and there was a college professor on the panel and he talked about um, young people um, not wanting to be engaged um, in politics anymore. And how can we um, make young people more involved? But I actually uh, reject that notion. I think young people, um, want to be intimately involved with the policy making um, and community-based work that we know that our communities um, need. I actually think that it's uh, precisely the people who are saying that young people don't want to be involved uh, are the people that have uh, 
been at the helm of the reason why young people have not had seats at the table. Um, and so I think that it is um, the work for me, but also young elected leaders, um, specifically across LA County, Alton Wang in Pasadena, Sasha Perez in Alhambra, um, Lindsay Horvath, Chair of the Board of Supervisors, um, our Assembly Member Isaac Bryan, to be in the spaces, um, checking that bias, but also to make sure that we are actively doing the work to throw the ladder down um, for young people to continue to come up um, and show up and show out. Um, and so um, I think young people are um, increasingly involved. I think it just goes back to our earlier piece about policymakers needing to do the work to meet people where they are. Um, young people are very interested in talking about climate. They're very interested in talking about student loans. They're very interested in talking about um, um, making sure that we're protecting a woman's right to choose. Um, and I think that when policymakers come and talk about issues that young people might not see as the most pressing issue of the time, um, then it's often hard to hear from different voices when you're surrounded by an echo chamber. And so I think that my work, um, what I've done in my year and a half in office is uh, making sure that we are, uh, as policymakers, centered um, in uh, making sure that we build a community um, and a world for our younger generations um, to live into. Um, and so uh, I think young people are coming to the table. Um, they are doing increasingly um, good and 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 largely scaled activism work across the US. Um, and so I know that we'll we'll continue to see that uptick. Great. Well I just had a question. Um after your year and a half and current time working, um, do you still face instances of skepticism in your ability to effectively serve in your role? And if so, like how have you addressed or overcome these challenges or what do you have to say to people who are still a little bit like wary about having someone so young get impressive on the board? You know, it's a it's a good question, and I think that that is we see that show up when politicians have future jobs in mind um, and not the work that they can do in their current roles. And so, um, I'm not at the table um, to be liked. Um, I'm here to do the work. And when I got into office, um, one of my mentors told me that if you're um, actively anti-racist and everyone likes you, you're not doing it right. And so um, people and naysayers definitely still send emails and come to the to meetings to talk about, um, you know, young people's lack of ability. Um, but when the curtain is pulled um, and we look at the track record, my policies pass and they work. Um, I was very proud to carry the Black Student Achievement Plan um, motion my first day in office, I was sworn in and um, asked that that be a priority. Um, and right now, a year and a half later, over the summer, we um, sponsored a black literature camp, lit camp um, for students in the age ranges that we talked about earlier, who were flagged for not reading at grade level. So kids, um, I think from kindergarten to fifth grade, um, all black students who came into the program um, were, entering not reading at grade level and every single kid left that program six weeks during the summer um, reading at least at grade level but overwhelmingly reading uh, above grade level. Uh, most kids left that program having engaged in Q&As and met Black authors and left that program wanting to be writers. And so I think that that goes back to um, our piece of that you can't be what you can't see. Um, and so when people talk about um, inability, um, all we have to do is look at the report card um, and the effectiveness of what young people have been able to do um, on legislative bodies up and down the state. Thank you. Um, and you're saying you're pushing for racial um, equality in terms of like pushing these boundaries and bringing these gaps together. Um, and Baruch has a great question along those same lines. Yeah, when you like bring up these topics in like meetings, what sort of like blockades are you faced with when pushing for like more equitable environments for black students? And how have you like overcome them? 
you know, it's a, it's a, it's a great question. When I, um, I think it's very common oftentimes for first um, in every capacity, um, not just legislative, but um, for first in the room to take on that heavy lifting of um, carrying the unlearning that needs to happen from a culture that thrived without representation um, on elected bodies. And so uh, my work in the district is making sure that um, I am helping us all um, unlearn what I have deemed harmful status quo uh, practices and priorities um, and not being afraid of the fact that we've never done that before. And so when I came to the table um, in private meetings um, in the district office in City Hall, um, I was told um, that we were moving too fast, we were too eager, um, and that uh, we've never done this before, so we must uh, ease into the changes that our communities um, are, are, are calling for. And my simple answer is um, simply the fact that I think the definition of insanity is doing the same thing and expecting a different outcome. And so um, if we have had status quo policies for the last hundreds and hundreds of years, um, it's my humble opinion that this is the time for urgency. And this is the time to be unafraid of trying new and innovative ways of making sure that we are um, educating each student in our district. Great. Well, shifting from that to more of your vision and core beliefs, I wanted to pass it to Amy to ask her question next. Yeah. Um, can you elaborate on what your core belief of those closest to the pain should be closest to the power means to you? And when did you come up with this phrase? It's good. It's a good question. I I don't think that I came up with the phrase. I think that it's a common used phrase um, for people in positions of power who truly believe that lived and shared experience is um, a very important factor in transformational change. Um, and so for me, I think that if we are having very uh, frank and deep conversations about uh, policing and criminal justice reform, mass incarceration, the answers to how we unlearn and uproot racist and harmful policies is not to exclude those who have been affected um, historically. And so I think that people who have suffered the um, repercussions of um, harmful legislative um, practices and priorities are the people who have the lived and shared experience to be at the table to help us um, course correct, but also move forward. Um, I think that it was people who weren't at the table who got us here. And so I don't think that it's the work of those same people to help get us out. Yes, lived and shared experience is so important, especially for creating new new rules and just shedding light on so much. And I think Sarah has a great question that kind of follows this um, this line. Yeah, so um, in February 2023, the Culver City School Board approved your proposal for the Black Student Achievement Plan, which you had just mentioned. You uh, said you prioritized it first thing when you were sworn in, which is super incredible. Um, and according to a USC Annenberg media article I read that was written about yourself, some constituents said that your leadership was emotionally driven. Um, and there's no doubt that emotions have a place in politics, I believe. But why, in your view, do some view emotions as a sign of weakness? You know, it is an interesting question because I don't know that I can ask that people who have suffered um, harmful policies not be emotional when um, people are coming to the table and are being told that um, they are using racial tropes, that you know we are playing identity politics. Um, I think when you know what's at stake um, and people are against what you know will be transformational for um, people's actual day-to-day -day lives and their futures to come, um, it's very hard not to 
uh, get emotional. To me, when we look at data, it's more than just numbers. I think that I see when we talk about and when we see the chart of um, Black students making up 10, 12% of our district, but 50% of our suspension and expulsion, it's very hard uh, for me not to get emotional because I think that I can personally um, relate and see myself in those um, numbers and in that data. Um, but I also, because of my community-based work, have been in the district, so I know who we are directly impacting um, should this policy pass or not. Um, and so I think that um, we have gotten to a point where politicians, specifically in D.C., are maybe for the most part desensitized um, and so far removed from where the community needs them to be. Uh, but as a fresh voice who uh, has only been here a year and a half, I am not. And I ran for office less than a year after graduating myself. Um, and so I, 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 I'm not sure why emotions are seen as a weakness. Um, I think that it is a plus, and I think that it is, uh, we're doing emotional work, um, knowing that we're impacting um, kids' lives every day. I mean, just to add, I know you're a political science major, and so am I, and I feel like we spend so much time learning about the history of all of these different places and how politics and, I don't know, past law and systems are put in place to create these these effects and how they they in turn affect people's emotions everywhere. And by ignoring the emotions, it kind of cuts out this crucial dimension um, that surrounds this entire narrative and initiative and in politics. So I think it's great to use it more of as, as an anchor, honestly, to to navigate and guide politics for the future. Um, and I just wanted to ask a question about whether you could elaborate on um, more of your Black student achievement plan and the emotional resonance of the plan um, and how it contributes to addressing systemic inequalities within the district. Great question. Um, it is work that, in my opinion, um, is some of the most substantial uh, work that we've done maybe next to our equity plan in our district. Um, it not only points out the um, Black struggles that the data is showing that our students are facing in our district, but also where our Black kids are excelling. And I think often when we have conversations about um, the Black and Brown community, we only face, or we only surround ourselves with negatives and where um, specifically in this instance, Black students are um, underperforming. Um, and in our plan, we're actually talking about that and where Black students are excelling. It focuses on a few things. Um, one, the importance of Black literacy, we talk about the fact that we know that Black kids need to be learning if they're going to be successful in this world. Um, but we also created um, a Black Families Council and a Black Students Advisory Council to work in conjunction with our Office of Diversity and Inclusion. Um, I am the board member that represents um, the governing body on the Black Families Council myself. Um, but again, it's that piece of that we talked about earlier, the people closest to the pain should be closest to the power and who better than black families um, to be a part of the decision making when we talk about how to educate black learners in our district each and every day. Um, so we talk about that. We talk about the importance of having um, diverse representation in our um, all of our bodies at every single level um, um, of our district. We are doing really well and have a high number of Black administrators, which is great, um, but a lower and underrepresentation in Black educators. And so we talk about um, the need to have an intentional focus on recruitment and retention. But an issue that I ran during the campaign is first and foremost, we need to make sure that this is a district that Black and Brown educators and students um, can come and thrive. And so instead of just having the end goal I'm in mind, there is pre-work that I know that we need to do in order to make sure that this is a safe space for them to come and thrive. Because the last thing that I would wanna see is for black educators, black students, 
black families that come into a district or an institution that does not support them and then leave oftentimes um, more disadvantaged than they came in. Um, and so we talk about um, that. And we also talk about making sure that we are um, putting our money where our mouth is. I'm very proud to um, be reporting that our, for the first time in our district's history, it's an outcap writing year, which is um, our governing bodies, um, the vessel at which we look at all policies. And it's the way that we state mandated have to come up with plans to how to support our disadvantaged students. Jerry Brown gave school boards the power when he was governor um, and said, put it in your LCAP. I'm giving it to the to the board and to the community, put it in your LCAP. Um, and uh, what we've seen is that the only communities that need to be represented in an LCAP is students that are directly related to underduplicated funding. So our English learners, our foster youth, and our unhoused, as well as our students with disabilities and IEPs. Um, I inherited a third year plan. And so you rewrite the plan every three years. And I was the lone no vote last year um, because black kids wasn't mentioned once in our plan. And this is directly related to the budget. And if we as a body are saying that that plan is um, the vessel in which we show our values, not having black kids mentioned is not my values. Um, and so we are now in an LCAP writing year. I'm very happy to report, and this is the good news, um, that black kids is goal seven um, in our LCAP. And that is where I thought it would be sustained for at least three years, because after the LCAP writing year, you cannot um, drastically change the plan. Um, and so we are uh, putting our money where our mouth is and saying that black kids are a um, valuable and important um, priority for the district and the governing body, and we are going to make sure that that work is sustained long before I leave, or long after I leave. That's great to know. Um, so shifting your conversation back to your experience, like directly on the board, I wanted to pass the conversation or pass the um, mic to Baruch to ask this question. Uh, I feel like you've touched on this a little bit already, but. What functional flaws have you seen or experienced like within the board? And what structural changes do you think should be made uh, to make the effect of the board stronger on the Culver City School District? What structural flaws? Um, yeah. Functional changes, yeah. Yeah, 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 great question. Um, you know, it's, it's really interesting because we are regulated by the legislature. So the legislature, um, writes policies and passes them in Sacramento that then we have to follow. Um, and I don't know if you know this about politicians and people who are either in Sacramento or in DC, but it is very much do as I say, not as I do. I um, mean, so the uh, people in the legislature created what California, what local officials in California know as, know as the Brown Act. Um, and it basically uh, says, and I think the premise is important, but how it actually actualizes is where we see um, an inability to do our work. Um, the, the, the idea was how do we make sure that um, local elected leaders aren't having backdoor conversations and are doing the people's work within the purview of the public, but where it shows up pretty hard in our um, local offices, specifically our offices that are governing bodies of five, um, is that the Brown Act also prohibits more than a majority, like more than a majority or at or majority or more of the board cannot talk about specific issues um, that'll be business before the board. And so when it's a, a body of five, um, on each issue, there's two, two, and then one's left out. And so how can we effectively govern when we are for the first time engaging with each other on an issue um, in an open setting. It's very interesting. There's a lot of studies around um, actually the uh, makeup of diocese and our diocese is, is like a flat U. So we face the public and there's actually studies that show that the, that um, makeup of a diocese um, decreases 
governing bodies from engaging with each other and increases um, governing bodies' performance to the public um, because we're looking directly at the public, we're directly looking at cameras. Um, and so there's not enough of this of us engaging with each other to bring each other along in the work that um, we know we need to to do, and it, it increases this. And so there's a lot of there's a lot of this, and there's a lot of um, um, I don't I I don't know if I want to say performance work, but there's a lot of um, um, there there's not enough engaging with each other, and so um, I definitely think that it is um ironic that people in the legislature can have caucus meetings where the entire democratic caucus which is a super majority of the legislature can have closed door caucus meetings about what they're supporting and what they're not supporting and the reasons why um, but are telling local officials that we have to govern like this and i think that that when we talk about an uptick in polarization um intention on governing bodies um i think that the brown act is 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 at the helm and the precipice of that um and so um, that is definitely something that I didn't necessarily know how it would impact me going into um, the school board, but I definitely know now it has made governing pretty hard. So bringing it back to ideas of um, idealized democracy versus the reality of democracy, I wanted to invite Amy to ask her next question. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I think a lot of Gen Zers have started to realize that democracy isn't like this idealized form that we're taught about in school, um, that it comes with many flaws. And of course, like no political system will ever be perfect. But has your has your own view on democracy on what it means to you? Um, has it changed throughout your journey in local politics? Um, well, my view on democracy and our ability to uphold it um, has been threatened before. And I think America's democracy was threatened on January 6th. And the fact that um, the same former um, twice impeached president it, is on the ticket to maybe um, be the president of the United States definitely ch challenges my views um, on how we um, as Americans can uphold our democracy. And so, um, I trust that in Culver City and on our body, um, we, I actually think every one of us can actually agree on the importance of, of upholding democracy, but I, I, I find that often challenged when our nation's capital um, has a riot incited on it um, because of a uh, election outcome. And so the fact that that is still a possibility in 2024 going into this presidential year definitely challenges my views on democracy, not just as a school board member, but as an American citizen, as a voter myself. Um, definitely, I, I I think about that often, and I know that um, we have to do that work as policymakers and youth organizers to make sure that people really know what's at stake. Um, and so uh, I think that we've got it, at least in Culver City, locally. Um, I'm more focused and concerned, and I think that the American people are more focused and concerned on how democracy is being threatened in Washington, D.C. And unfortunately, we're running out of time. So for our last question, I wanted to pass it to Sarah um, to ask about um, experience and chosen work. Yeah, kind of wrapping it up with your back going back to your own personal experience. Um, about a year ago at a board meeting, you said to students, you deserve a life that is not defined by your productivity or your chosen work or what age you entered that work. To me, this statement kind of seems to refer to a culture of like college and career preparedness in school that can become toxic at times. Um, was this something that you experienced yourself and how can we encourage students to pursue a career and a passion that interests them while also holding space for them to enjoy their childhood experiences? Yeah, thank you, Sarah. Um, that question or that quote was actually in a direct response to um, people questioning um, my ability to govern because I am um, dared to show emotions uh, publicly about the work that we're doing. I um, mean, that quote and that speech during that opening statement uh, wasn't about me 
I'm fine. Like I am not worried or do I let it um, uh, take up much of my time. Um, and I don't lose sleep at night from, you know, community members who don't see the importance of, of young people coming to the table. But what I could not allow was for um, young students, our student reps, our students in the district, our ASB kids, our students in student government, um, our college students who look at that um, abuse, quite frankly, and allow for that to go unchecked. So it was a bigger picture item for me to say, hey, I'm fine. The comments that I got, I can take. Um, but for us to also affirm to students who are watching and carefully taking note to how we respond in this moment to know that um, we've got their back and that uh, students belong everywhere at every single table where decisions are being made, including elected office. And so um, I'm trying to circle back to to the question I think I answered, but I'm not I'm not sure I know we're running out of time, but I think I I, I hope I answered. Perfect. Yeah, that's a perfect note to end on. Like students do belong everywhere and they will be everywhere as people continue to learn. So why not embrace them and encourage them to to do more? But um, well, thank you so much for being here. I've really enjoyed getting to talk and as well as the student council and hearing of your experience, vision and plan for the future. Um, and just wanted to say thank you so much. Thank you so much, student council and the, the Vendee Museum and also Thomas Manhouse for having me. Thank you.